Good evening. Thank you for joining Lawrence Hill in conversation with Aaron Perry. On the right hand side of your screen is a chat box. Please use this to submit your questions and comments to our speakers. Today we are here to celebrate Black History Month with a discussion about Lawrence Hill's new middle grade book, Beatrice and Croc Henry. Lawrence has long been a friend of Hamilton Public Library. The Illegal was Hamilton Reads in 2016, and we are tremendously pleased to host this conversation about his newest book. We invite you to join this and our other Black History Month programs and to read these books as part of an ongoing commitment to reading diversely and supporting regional authors. I will take a moment to acknowledge that the city of Hamilton is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase of 1792, between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Today, the city of Hamilton is home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of this land so that we can better understand our roles as residents, neighbours, partners and caretakers. We encourage you to find Lawrence's publications at local independent bookstores like Epic Books at their Lock and Sherman Avenue locations, King West Books in Westdale, The City and the City on Ottawa Street, and all retailers that support books and literacy. Lawrence Hill is the award-winning and internationally best-selling author of 10 books of fiction and nonfiction, including The Book of Negroes, which was made into a six-part TV miniseries, and The Illegal, both of which won CBC Canada Reads. He is a member of the Order of Canada and a winner of the Commonwealth Writers' Prize and the Rogers Writers' Trust Fiction Prize, and a co-winner of the NAACP Award and a Canadian Screen Award. He lives with his wife, the writer Miranda Hill, in Hamilton, Ontario, and in Woody Point, Newfoundland. Aaron Perry is a recent McMaster University graduate. He currently serves as the Youth Development Program Coordinator at the Afro-Canadian Caribbean Association and works part-time as a writer, artist, and graphic designer. I'll pass things over to Aaron, who will begin the conversation. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be here with you today. Happy Black History Month. Um, like was said, my name is Aaron and I have the pleasure today of interviewing Lawrence Hill and this is such an honor for me as I've been a fan of Lawrence's books for so long and I'm sure it's just as much an honor for all of you to be here today listening to our words and our conversation. So before we begin our discussion, I'd like to invite Lawrence to provide us with a reading from his new book, Beatrice and Croc Harry. Uh, thank you so much, Aaron. I really appreciate it and thank you so much to the Hamilton Public Library for welcoming me back. Uh, I've been living in Hamilton for about 14 years, but also I've been in and out of the library a hundred thousand times, it feels like. So it's really nice to be back again for this virtual visit. And just to kick things off, I will read just a paragraph from the opening of Beatrice and Croc Harry, which um, as Aaron and I will discuss, is a novel about a young girl who wakes up with complete amnesia alone in a massive forest without any idea who she is or where she comes from or she has a family. Her memory has been erased and she's been kicked out of the human race. And so her job is to see if she can make her way back to she does not know what. <laughs> and so these are the opening lines from Beatrice and Crack Harry. Uh, the first chapter of the novel is called An Awful Lot of Places for Something to Go Wrong. And here are Beatrice's first perceptions as she wakes up alone and with amnesia in the forest of Argelia. Beatrice was not entirely sure if she was dead. She raised two fingers to her lips and felt her own warm breath. She appeared to be awakening from a deep, dark dream in which she had either died or come close to it. As she opened her eyes and studied their circumstances, the facts confirmed that she was alive. She didn't know much, but she knew this. Her name was indeed Beatrice. It had a certain flow, three syllables, and never just two. Thank you very much. That's how the novel opens. Erin? Beautiful. Thank you so much for that. I, I love it. It's such a great 
opening and I, I particularly love the uh Beatrice with three syllables not two very much just I, I I just I don't know there's something about that that I love but yeah so let's get to it so I think the the thing that I, I'd like to talk about first is I've read briefly that Beatrice and Croc Harry is it's actually inspired by bedtime stories you tell to your own daughter at night and I was wondering if you could give us a little more insight into kind of the origin of the book and its development from a bedtime story to a full-blown book now. Sure, thanks, Aaron. Well, I have five children, and the youngest is Beatrice, my daughter Beatrice now, not the fictional Beatrice in the novel. And my daughter Beatrice is 22, just finished university, uh, you know, University of Toronto. And she um, came into my life when she was three three years old, as did her older sister, Evangeline. So Moran and I, my wife and I married, and she brought two children into the new family, and I brought three, and suddenly I had five children. And I take this very seriously. And a lot of people talk about blood. Well, I'm not so much interested in blood. I'm interested in the relationships that you have and the relationships that you can form, whether or not you're biologically responsible. If a child comes into your life, well, in my view, I became, and in her view, thankfully for me, I became her father, except in every way, except biologically. I raised her, supported her, loved her. But it's work, you know, to to love a child uh, when they just end, walk into your life and they're already formed. You know, at three, they're quite formed already. And so one of the ways that I worked at it to try to build this relationship was to tell her stories, bedtime stories. And of course, the secret to telling a bedtime story to a child is to, make the protagonist very much like the child who's listening, except a little older, a little smarter, a little wiser, a little more wild, doing impossibly exciting things. And so every night, Beatrice would hear me tell a story about a girl named Beatrice who was always fending off a hun hungry crocodile. And every night, the crocodile would almost devour her. And at the last minute, she would outsmart the jaws of death and live to walk another day through the forest. And Beatrice, my child, loved these stories and they made her so excited. And she made me promise that one day I'd turn them into a novel and um, make her the character and dedicate the book to her. And so here we are. It took me 15 years and a few other books got in the way, but um, here we are finally with the novel that originated with those bedtime stories. I love that. That's It's, it's so amazing to kind of see that, that this was it's now a book, but it was something that kind of served as a major tool in developing your relationship. And I know that um, I've heard from my dad who had a similar um, similar interaction with my older sister, who's my half sister, and kind of just building that trust. And it's so important for parents to do that kind of thing and find ways to kind of build those bridges. So I, I definitely appreciate hear about, hearing about that. And I think that, you know, so something else that goes along with being a parent, I think specifically, you know, our, our community understands this is kind of the important lessons that we need to talk to our children, sometimes difficult conversations. And uh, I think that that's something that's beautifully done within this book, not even with just uh, intense scenes like a crocodile trying to devour a girl, but also just very intricately weaved uh, social issues in there. And I think much like your other books, uh, Beatrice and Croc Harry presents readers with an intriguing story while also tackling real world, world issues such as anti-Black racism. And I was wondering if you could speak on the importance and even possibly the difficulty of tackling often intense and emotional issues in books for a younger audience. Sure. Well, I mean, I think you'd find this also, say you interviewed a painter who had been painting for 30 years, you know, I've been publishing for 30 years. Or say you interviewed even, you know, um, a filmmaker who'd been doing films. You'd probably find that there were certain themes that the filmmaker or the painter naturally just kept coming back to because we have certain obsessions and we want to explore them in our art. And I sort of think of all my books as sort of parts of, of a whole mural of expression that I'm trying to produce. And each book is like a painting or a bit of a painting inside that mural. And and so I keep coming back to issues of identity and blackness and alienation and the search for home and the search for belonging and making one's way through a, a sometimes a hostile world. And these are themes that I uh, that I often have explored in well pretty well always to keep coming back to in different ways, I hope, in my fiction, so that each book seems very different. Uh, certainly feels different to me. But this time, you know, it's a first because I'm writing for children. Well, I hope for adults too. But, uh, you know, the book's marketed to nine to 14 year olds. 
uh, in any adult who feel like reading kids' books, which I still love to do. And um, it's a, a little trickier because I think more so than when you're writing for adults, you know, you can't give a child a smackdown in a book. You know, you need you need to excite a child and enliven them and make them see the possibilities in life. And I want any child who reads my book to feel better about themselves when they finish the book than they did when they started. I want the book, mm -hmm. I don't mean to uplift them in a phony way, but, but I, I want the book to be, to make them feel good. And so it's challenging because you have to address painful issues, which children know about and deserve to read about, uh, but also to do so in an entertaining and uplifting way. So it was uh, challenging. And I tried to deal with that by being really playful and often funny and sometimes a bit slapstick and, and also rejoicing in, in language and the play of language. So those are some of the techniques I use to kind of slip the reader a bitter pill. <laughs> mm -hmm, definitely. And I, I think that yeah, I, I can imagine it's it's something that's very important to you, like coming back to those important themes. And I, yeah, it's very interesting to think about kind of the transition to speaking on these topics for children, because obviously, yeah, you have to do it in a softer way, in a very meaningful way. And um, I'm wondering, what was it like for you personally to be doing a children's book? Because I know that a lot of the other books are more kind of designed for maybe my age group or a little bit more. What was that like for you in terms of the just the writing process or did this feel like kind of a, a step in a different direction or was it refreshing for you or? It, was, it felt fantastic. It felt like a door had been blown off, a roof had been blown off my house and suddenly I could go flying like into the air. It felt like a, a liberation. And I think it's because every form of writing has its strictures, has its restrictions, has its limits and its requirements. And when I'm writing a novel like The Book of Negroes, you know, for adults, which I know you mentioned, you read when you were going to high school in, in Grimsby, and that one came out, whatever, 15 years ago now. Uh, when I'm writing a novel like that, I'm really striving for, you know, to dramatize something, but also to maintain a certain sense of historical authenticity. So there's a great obligation to replicate history, at least as I understand it, it's in a personal interpretation, but re replicate it honestly and, and be historically accurate as much as I can while writing fiction, while inventing a story. But in this case, I didn't have any of those limits. I didn't have to be authentically replicating real life, whatever that means. And mm -hmm. I could just kind of go wild and be like a parent just telling the most impossible bedtime story that hopefully is entertaining. And so it made me feel so joyous and playful because I got to kind of come out and dance on the page in ways that other books wouldn't have allowed me to do. I could be kind of effervescent. And, and do things that in an adult novel I couldn't. Like this book features a talking crocodile with a PhD mm. vocabulary. And you know, normally a book that I would write for adults wouldn't allow for that kind of thing because it would seem inappropriate, you know, in the kind of book I, I would write normally. So I felt like it was a liberation and it really sent me into, you know, all sorts of dances of joy. And it, it felt like the happiest writing experience I'd had for a long time. And it, it felt like I was kind of back at the edge of a bed telling a story to my children when they were still young. And so it, it let, let me be more playful than usual on the page. That's beautiful. I, I love that it, it felt like something liberating to you and just I, I never would have thought about the, I, the fact that there's so many different avenues that you can take that you obviously couldn't take in your other books like doing a talking crocodile is, is something that you know you don't often think about but <laughs> that's amazing and I honestly as, as someone who read it and I, I think that I loved it as soon as I read it and I, I think that I remember reading books like this when I was younger but obviously not kind of the stories that are coming from our community and I think it's so amazing to see that and to see that you've written this and do you think that this will be your last children's book or do you think that this is a kind of a new avenue you want to explore more well, are you inviting me to write another, Aaron? I mean, <laughs> I, I I think there's a need for it. I might. <laughs> I'm the only one voicing it at the moment, but I think I'm, I'm sure you've heard from other people that they they want more of this because it's regardless of re, or, or representation, which is very much important. It's it's an amazing book, and you're such an amazing writer for a children's book. When we've seen something that's a lot of your works before that are very different, and it's amazing to see that you beautifully transitioned into this new genre so i think that 
I speak for a lot of people and I, I think that you should definitely, you know, explore this a, li a little bit more, even if it's just one more short story. I would I'd like, <laughs> thanks Aaron. I'd like to write a sequel. And mm -hmm. I left the door open without revealing, you know, all the details of the ending. So we won't reveal the ending of the book, but I, um, I left the door wide open, as you know, and, and I'd like to send Beatrice back, you know, into the forest of Argelia again in the sequel and have her deal with a big problem again. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know for sure, but I, part of it will depend on whether the market will allow me to. I've never really written a book, book for children before, a novel for children at least, and, and I don't know if it's going to do well enough, you know, for a publisher to want to buy a sequel because I'm really moving into a totally new form of writing. But if it does well enough for the publisher to be interested in buying a, a sequel, I would definitely write one. I have this other book that I've been that I set aside to write this book and I really want to get back to it. And uh, and I'd like to write that novel first. That's another novel for adults and it's about the the thousands of African African Americans who came up from the deep south from American military bases during World War II. My father was an African-American soldier in the U.S. Army in World War II, by the way, but then my grandfather was an African-American officer in the U.S. forces in the First World War. But anyway, during the Second World War, thousands of African-American soldiers from the Deep South were brought out of their military bases in places like Georgia and Louisiana and sent up to Yukon and northern B.C. to build the Alaska Highway in the coldest winter on record. So we had thousands of black people in the far north of Canada in 1942-43 building the Alaska Highway when it was minus, you know, 50 degrees out. And uh, it's a fascinating story that few Canadians know about. And I'm writing a novel about this black engineer from Georgia whose who's, who's job is to help put down this highway in this terribly wicked winter up in northern Canada. Uh, in, the, in the Second World War, and I want to finish that book. But after that, I'd like to come back, and if the market would allow me to, and the publisher is willing, I would love to write a sequel to Beatrice and Clark Harry. And thank you, Aaron, for asking about that. Of course, I, I think that it's definitely, definitely something people would love to see, and I'm, I think we need more, more stories like this out here. I think that it was very much important to me for for me reading this, and I, I think that as someone who's twenty two, I sometimes you know don't read uh, books that are for younger audiences because I've been in university and I'm. You get so used to reading textbooks that you get very tired and you you kind of just are in that mindset. And I think that was very refreshing and in a way healing for me because I remember yeah. being being the little black kid in class who was very, very into sci-fi and fantasy and something that sometimes people often made fun of and people often kind of targeted you for because it's something that you're not really represented in. And you have a lot of people saying, well, there, there's no black people doing that or no black stories for that. And I think that this this is one of those stories that you can say, nope, look, look right here. There's an amazing uh, book that has sci-fi and fantasy elements. And I think that, you know, it was very amazing to see you know, a young black girl is the main protagonist in in that kind of story. It's something that we, we don't have enough of. And, you know, like, like I said, as someone who didn't grow up with many books like this, it definitely feels big, especially with, we have a big interest in our communities with Afrofuturism and exploring black futures and fiction in that respect. And I was wondering, what was it like for you to include science, science fiction and fantasy in the book? Like, were, were these kinds of stories that you were drawn to as a child? And you were interested into the page. <laughs> well, I read The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings and stuff like that when I was a boy, but I wasn't one of those kids who was totally entranced with fantasy as a child. I sort of dove straight into African American adult literature. By the time I was thirteen or fourteen, I was reading Malcolm X and you know um, uh, James Baldwin and uh, Langston Hughes and Richard Wright and you know the, the Zora Neale Hurston and sort of the famous. African American writers of the uh, of the mid twentieth century, um, but when I was a kid, I saw almost no literature for children that featured black characters. Certainly not as protagonists. Sometimes as window dressing, you know, for white characters like Huckleberry Finn and and the character Jim or something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, but never in a in a central way. And I'm wondering 
when you were growing up, and of course I was growing up in the early 60s, you were growing up in, in the early 2000s, uh, did you see any uh, literature featuring Black protagonists when you were growing up or going to libraries or in the elementary school or that kind of thing? Yeah, I think that uh, when I was growing up, it, there was a bit more representation, but I think it was very much always the same kind of niche. Like it, it was very always focused from a Black historical context. Um, whether that's enslavement or a period very close to that. So I, I think that I definitely appreciated having those stories as a kid, but after a while you kind of get to thinking like, are these the only roles we fill as characters? Or are these the only themes that we can kind of explore? And you, you kind of yearn a bit more for it. So I think I, I, yeah, I definitely grew up and was very blessed to have some characters out there. And I, I think that same thing with, you know, growing up with TV shows or cartoons where you have those things. But yeah, I, I think that definitely I saw a need for having dynamic characters and especially uh, black female characters, because I think that I grew up and it was mainly little black boys that were future, featured in these stories. And girls were definitely not the main protagonists of these stories. Like you said, they're usually the sidekick or the, the girl best friend and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I think it definitely is important to see uh, more characters like this in, in kind of fields like this and more interesting children's literature because yeah, sometimes kids don't just want to read history, especially if it's just about slavery at that age. And for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you asked about fantasy and um, I mean, the thing about fantasy for children is that you can offer children really interesting social issues that they can explore w w without seeming like you're beating them overhead with a message because it's happening with animals or, you know, alt you know, superhuman creatures or something that's not quite human. So the child is able to kind of step into it and feel free and they kind of leave their world and just enter this fantasy, but still engage with really profound social issues. And so Beatrice and the characters in the book, like this rabbit, she she meets this speckled rabbit named Horace Harrison Jr. the third, is um, you know, he's encountering a form of racial discrimination, you know, in the forest. And and he's standing up for it, and Beatrice wants to as well when she learns about it. And and um and there are other sinful you know, hateful, racist uh, initiatives bubbling up in the world and Beatrice is beginning to get a sense of them before she even leaves the forest or tries to leave the forest. And um, and so I'm able to introduce some really interesting issues that, that play out every day in our in our day to day lives uh, without without sort of naming them as such and making them entertaining and allowing a child to imagine the struggles of a tarantula or a rabbit or a crocodile or a girl who's befriending all three of them. And so it gives you a lot of latitude to sort of explore social issues without appearing too heavy handed or like without preaching at the child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think that, yeah, it's a very, it's, it, I think it takes a lot of skill to do that. And I think that that's, that's a credit to authors like you who kind of slip those stories in there and find creative ways to do it. But I think it's also a very beautiful thing for children to face because I think either you have a lot of kids where they're, it, it gets them asking questions and asking their parents questions, which kind of raises conversations that they might be having. And, you know, as, as black children, that that's something that, you know, having the talk with your parents is a thing that we all face at some point. And whether it raises questions or even if you're taking the lessons from the book, purely from a fictional stance and you're empathizing with those characters and then you you learn it later on in life. I, I feel like I, 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 one of the things I felt like with the book is that it very much embodies kind of the features of a classic in that way where you watch things a hundred times. Like I remember watching like The Wizard of Oz and Harry Potter and all those classics when you're a kid and just enjoying them. And then you actually realize as an adult, you're like, oh wow, that was a symbol for that. And that that's why and it's, it's just amazing to kind of see how you you empathize so much with maybe just the fictional characters and then it's it's slowly teaching you these lessons at the end of the day and it's, it's yeah well to kind of see that realization over the years and those conversations that come out of it 
It's so true. Like in Harry Potter, for example, in Harry Potter was all the rage when my children were young. So I read all of the Harry Potter books so I could keep up with them because I wanted to be able to talk with them around the dinner table about these books that they were just devouring and so excited about. So yeah. I wanted to be part of those family conversations. So I read them all too. Now they read them many times. I just read them once, but I did mm -hmm. read each book once and quite enjoyed them. But mm -hmm. I mean, the word doesn't appear in the novel, but Harry Potter is all about genocide. Like basically, mm -hmm. Lord Voldemort, the antagonist, the, the you know the neg the nasty diabolical creature, his goal is to exterminate mixed race wizards, mm -hmm. and Harry's job is to try to prevent the extermination of mixed race wizards. It's a book about racial hatred. Mm -hmm. It's a book about a one wizard's attempt to exterminate other wizards of you know of a certain race, even though he too belongs to that race, by the way. And so, mm -hmm. um, uh, but but of course, the word genocide. In the Holocaust, those words don't appear in the book, but mm -hmm. that's what kids are reading about for thousands of pages. And so, I mean, if J.K. Rowling can do it, I don't see any reason why I can't also approach, you know, really hard hitting, serious issues, but do so in an entertaining and engaging way with, with elements of, of, of fantasy. The one thing I found really challenging artistically was to um, write a book that really explored issues like the acquisition of and the development of a positive racial identity. You know, they were, the obligation even among children to confront racial hatred, to understand it, to try to get to the root of it, and then to try to stop it. Um, these are big issues in the loss of identity and why one's identity would be stolen from one and how to get it back and how to find your way back to yourself. These are really important questions, but the challenge was to write about it in a way that was funny. And that is not easy to take really heavy themes and to be comical, it's dangerous. You know, you could really irritate people if you do it wrong. You have to hit the notes just right, get the right balance. And and I found that uh, challenging and very exciting. And I loved trying to give it a run to be funny and to be entertaining and to capture, you know, I want that child to turn the pages and their parent or grandparent too. And I mm -hmm. really want the book to, to draw them in. So uh, I was looking to be funny. And and that's hard, you know, when you're writing about painful issues. Yeah, yeah, I I can definitely imagine there's a lot of difficulty in kind of presenting that in a proper way, where you're making sure that you're not stepping on any toes, but you're also you know <laughs> getting it out there. And I think that one of the things I loved was you included such strong themes and plot details that you know related to the black experience and relate to the experience of a lot of racialized folk and. Particularly, I felt it since as someone who is mixed race, I, I definitely felt it in a lot of these stories. And I think, uh, like you said, you, you definitely embedded it with humor and love and passion. I think one of the things I definitely picked up on that I think I'm sure kids like me will also pick up on is kind of the idea of like side quests in your main journey when you're a black youth. And one of those things is Beatrice trying to figure out how to do her own hair and I, it took me until like two years ago <laughs> to figure out how to do my own hair. And I'm 22 and I think that, you know, like I I don't remember ever even having books that are thinking about the idea that we have to take that extra step that other people don't. We need to put in that effort. And I think that, you know, it's it, it was beautiful to see that in there. And I, I think it, it definitely was in a very lighthearted way where you, where you can look at that. And I, I'm someone who went through that and I could definitely like laugh back on it and be like oh that's a that's a funny storyline this and that but i know that it also it also means something to these kids because you you have kids growing up who don't know these things or sometimes you have their parent doesn't really know what to do and stuff like this encourages them to ask questions like well maybe i should be maybe i should be doing this or maybe i i, I should be or, or just kind of normalizing the fact that they they have these little side quests and i, I use that because it's it's very indicative of adventures which is very much the story and i think that it kind of very much relates to our experience because we have those side quests of how to do your hair trying to be comfortable with uh who you are as a person trying to be comfortable with your skin tone or your features and very much uh they're, they're deeply embedded in the story and and for beatrice and i wondered that um, did, did you feel like you ever were putting any of your personal experiences or your kind of personal emotions and feelings w during your adolescence into the character of Beatrice at all? Very much so. 
not autobiographically, but sometimes mm-hmm. writing about the person I wish I'd been able to be when I was a child. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, my father was black and he, he was very much an activist. I mean, he was the first director and then chair of the Ontario Human Rights Commission. And he, he, he co-founded the Ontario Black History Society with my mother and he was the Ombudsman of Ontario. So he spent his life in the civil rights movement, but he also had some self-hatred you know, which is unfortunate, but we sometimes find inside black communities. And he was teaching me when I was young that I should not like my hair and that I should try to straighten it, which you get a lot in black communities, and that I should every night go to bed as a boy with a stock a nylon stocking cap over my head to try to straighten my unruly curls. First of all, do you know how much that itches? It's horrible, like it's torture to wear a nylon cap over your head when you're a boy. Second of all, it's humiliating. And third of all, it doesn't even work. You know, do you think a nylon stocking cap is going to stomp out your curls? No way. That's yeah. not happening. <laughs> and it's a terrible message to give to a child that there's something wrong with their hair and it should be fixed or straightened. And it was an awful message. And it took me a long time to really, not just because of that, but because of all the messages that are negative that children can get. It took me, it took me till I was about 17 before I really began to embrace my hair I grew out a wickedly big afro and was really proud of it. And, but it took me all that time till I was about 17 before I kind of was ready for that afro and to really live it. You know, and of course, that mm. when I was growing up, the afro was the hairstyle to use if you're really embracing your black pride. This is the early 1970s. The afro was the hairstyle of the day, if yeah. that's what your thing was. And so I grew one, too, because I wanted to be part of that part of that movement. And um, uh, and so Beatrice loves her hair. She doesn't quite know who she is yet. She doesn't even quite understand yet that she's black, but she's going to grow into a sense of blackness as her amnesia begins to dissipate and she begins to understand more about who she is. But um, I love the, the hair as a tool, and I wish that I had been Beatrice. And I would want every child, black or any other background, to love who they are and to love how they look and to accept how they look and to feel good about that no matter what their mixture is or who they are. And Beatrice loves herself. She loves her hair. She's trying to figure out what to do with it. She stumbles along the way a bit, uses coconut water. That's not going to work. But she eventually finds her way to to cornrows and then an afro and things like that. But it takes her a little bit of work. And that's supposed to be entertaining. But um, I wish that I'd had Beatrice's self-love when I was a child. And I want, I want every child to feel is good about the way they look and about their hair that Beatrice does. I, yeah, I definitely agree. I, I think that I would have loved to be Beatrice and have that kind of passion and self-love and also kind of the the defense of who she is. Is It's like she knows one of the most amazing things is that during the story, she doesn't really know who she is, but at the same time, she knows who she is in a way, and that sounds very meta, but... It's yeah, I very much picked up on how she very it's it, there wasn't an ounce of hatred in her for herself. I, th- I think that a lot of the time you touch on kind of her being frustrated at things, which is very normal. But I, th- I think that's that's a good avenue to go in in, in terms of saying, well, like it, frustration at things is normal. Like, you know, it takes time. It, same thing with hair, like sometimes black hair can be frustrating just because of the amount of time you know you're braiding for six hours it's normal to get frustrated but yeah it's it's awful that we we have youth who sometimes just are still growing up in the atmospheres where they're taught uh self-hatred towards blackness or towards their own identity and i think the book definitely tackles this in a proactive way and i think that one of the things i very much resonated with and, and thought that I would have loved to be Beatrice was how she is just so staunchly just not taking anyone's BS towards her. She is not going to be disrespected. She refuses to and very much has the same thing as me where if she feels disrespected, she's going to sit there and plot ways how she's going to come at it the next time. And I think that that's something I always felt myself doing when I was younger, like, okay, what what should I have said? And it's it's beautiful that she uses words to do that because I, I think you know it's words can sometimes be used in a very uh, rude way but she's intending her words to be used to defend herself and she does it in a beautiful way and does it without being rude and I think that that's that's a beautiful lesson because we we have a lot of kids growing up who are 
who do have to have these conversations in the classroom or on the playground and are having to actually defend themselves sometimes. And I think it's it's very important for them to see a hero in Beatrice and say like, no, I don't have to take this. Like I, I can I can go home and whether it's going in the dictionary and finding a way to <laughs> kind of call them out on their their actions. But yeah, and I think that I, I love that. I, I love that. And I definitely agree. I wish I was more like Beatrice when I was younger, but that's the beautiful part is that we can, we can pass on these lessons to the next generation of children, because I, I think that's something you've spoken on and I've spoken on is both. We have these experiences from childhood that, you know, very much kind of tear kids down a lot of the time. But the, the beautiful fact is you can use avenues like books or even like parenting to kind of rewrite the history that you've you've kind of dealt with and kind of break the cycle of trauma and self-hatred and i think that beatrice and croc is just another amazing way that you've done that and i understand that as a parent i'm sure you have a lot of experience having those conversations did you feel like you were kind of going back to uh parenting methods because i know that you you said your youngest child now is in her early 20s did you feel like this was kind of a jump back to when you were a younger parent kind of having these little kids running around well it felt partly like that but it also felt like i was going back to my own childhood growing up with my parents around the in the dynamic in our family and although my father you know did slip up a bit with one aspect of the messaging about hair that i was telling you about and we all have our weaknesses and our strengths. We all have the points where we've done well and other points where we didn't do so well, let's be mm -hmm. honest. But he also gave me a lot of positive messaging. And one of the things my father taught me was that I should I should always stand up against injustice, including racial injustice. And if I heard somebody using the N word or I heard somebody doing something that was racist, that I should stand up and argue immediately and stand up and fight and um, and not let anybody get away with anything, including school teachers and principals and people much more powerful and older, you know, than I was. And um, he and that's a big number to give a child, but it also was a wonderful responsibility because it made me feel that I had the power to and I had the, the right to stand up and argue and, and 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 argue for what I knew was right when I saw that something going wrong in the world. And children are acutely aware of injustice. And I think that part of what I was trying to do was to show a child in reading the book that they too could stand up and fight against things that they know are wrong. I don't mean fight with their fists, but argue yeah. and fight and stand up against injustice when it shows up in your own backyard, in your own schoolyard, in your own forest, you know, where Beatrice is living. And mm -hmm. so I really wanted to kind of resurrect that memory of my own childhood. And I guess I'll say too that I was I was grieving before writing this book because my mother had died and my sister had died also in an accident. And I was really caught up in the grief of, of the loss of those two close people in my life. And so I wrote the novel to sort of go back to the really beautiful, joyous family moments that I had and all the kind of language play. And one of the things that my father gave to us in the way of language play was making up or using all sorts of crazy, rich, colorful words that I never heard anywhere else, like bum fuzzle, you know, which means to confuse somebody, or goozalum, which is, I think, was a word that seems kind of made up. I haven't heard other people using it. And the goozalum in this book is uh, just kind of a mysterious organ in the body that represents a human soul. And so if you're a good person, maybe you get to have a goozalum. And it's located in the body just a little bit north of the hippo flump, if you know where that is. Anyway, mm -hmm. so all the kind of the playful, silly language of my childhood, I wanted to kind of swim around in it and land it on the page so that a reader could feel that same joy of language. And just doing that made me feel better about the loss of my mother and my sister and helped me move through my own grief just to sort of go back to that family nest of language play. So I was trying to not just feel what I, I was doing as a parent with young children, but also what I felt as a child with parents, my, with parents looking after me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's it's beautiful to hear that this kind of functioned as a sort of healing method for you, because I think that that's something that you can even see in the book that it's it's kind of it's very much about family and kind of just those the importance of that and kind of just 
I, I don't know how to explain it, but it's it's very much an emotional story that touches on that. And honestly, I, I think this book is it's such a great read, and I definitely applaud you for you know once again blessing us with one of your beautiful well thought works. I think it gives us so many amazing lessons to youth, you know, particularly on like we said, loving yourself, even on forgiveness, treating others how you want to be treated. And I was just wondering if you could speak to kids right now who are reading the book. What are the dominant takeaways that you think you want youth to kind of take from this book? Well, love yourself, be yourself, go for it. You know, go for the things that you care about and love the play of language and love the joy of reading too. Reading shouldn't just be about getting through school or university or landing a job. You know, reading should be about stimulating the brain and having fun and enjoying, you know, the the use of your brain and your imagination, whether it's reading the sports pages, you know, in the newspaper, because you feel like reading about what happened in a sports game last night, that's fine. Or whether it's reading a fantasy novel or sci-fi or anything, mm -hmm. uh, a book by, you know, Margaret Atwood, it doesn't matter. Like read to be stimulated, to have fun, to enjoy. And, and that can be a lifelong pleasure. You can read for pleasure when you're seven and you can do it with your when you're 87. And so I guess I'd, I'd want to encourage children to read. And also, I'd want to encourage parents who might see this book or become aware of it or read it, to read with their children, to be seen reading, to read, to, to sometimes read the same book as their children, even if they're not reading it to their child, they could read it and then talk about the book with their children, which is what I did with my kids in terms of the Harry Potter books. They were reading it by themselves, but I read them too and we talked. And that was so much fun. It's really unifying as a family to sort of, or as friends too, you know, in a community to talk about a book that you've all read. And so I guess, you know, use literature as, as a kind of a friend. A book can be your best friend. A book can stay with you for life if you love it. And, uh, and it can bring you together with other people. So those are some of the messages that I would pass on the young people who are listening tonight. I love that. And I think everyone can definitely appreciate the emphasis on kids to read, but also parents reading with their kids or alongside their kids. I think it's it's beautiful and, you know, it, it functions in the same way as a book club. You know, kids aren't too young to have these conversations and to kind of spark that interest in language and talking about themes and creativity. And, you know, kids love to talk. You might as well give them something that's important and they can be passionate to talk about because, you know, sometimes I feel like even some parents might have that that gap with their kids sometimes and sometimes that can feel it having an interest in what your kids reading and I definitely love that. I'm just going to jump to the Q&A that we have here since we have a lot of amazing questions from our audience. Um, so Nadine asks, could you talk about the importance of having girls and black girls as heroes in stories? Well, it's vitally important to have girls and black girls and black women as heroes in stories. We've, you know, we've spent a few thousand years featuring, you know, dead white males, and uh, and and there's nothing wrong with featuring white males in fiction. But there are so many other people, you know, who 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 need a shot, who need to hold the microphone, who need to be able to tell their stories and have their stories expressed, and and to become characters in 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 fiction and in plays and in films. And so. Um, if you see characters that resemble you in some respect when you're growing up, then maybe you can become those people too. Maybe you can be inspired by the sorts of things you see those characters doing. But regardless of whether you see yourself as a black person, you know, you can still learn a lot regardless of your racial and ethnic and cultural backgrounds if you see a diversity of characters taking the lead in stories. You know, the world is not just about uh, black people playing as sidekicks, you know, for other people. And of course, one of the tragedies of so much literature is that's exactly where we've been relegated to is kind of to the margins of, of society and to the margins of our literature. And so my job is to try to bring us right into the middle of things where everybody else belongs to and get us right there in the heart of things. And so it's vitally important in children's literature and in literature for adults. And we're having quite a renaissance of black writing in Canada these days. There are some wonderful writers and some of them have been very fortunate, have done very well, and I'm lucky 
to be among them. And it's it's really an exciting time to be a black writer in Canada. And Aaron, you're writing too. And I'm wondering if you would tell us briefly what kind of writing you're doing. Yeah, for sure. Um, so currently right now, uh, I started a year ago, I work for Trad Magazine, which is a magazine based in and around Toronto and around Hamilton that's focused on kind of uplifting black writers and racialized writers. And so I'm part of kind of a group right now that you focus on a different issue every volume. And I am kind of one of the leads for fictional writing. So a lot of my writing is kind of focused on science fiction and Afrofuturism. I haven't done much so far. Usually in the past, it used to be more nonfiction based because I was coming from university background and when they would tell me to write something, I was like, I don't know, I'll just write an essay <laughs> or something would get kind of stressed. But yeah, I've been kind of going a little more into fictional writing. Uh, same kind of thing we've talked about, you know, infusing kind of stories and themes that speak to me as a person, speak to my experiences and kind of the lessons I've learned in a fictional and kind of fantasy way. And, and like you said, it's it's definitely very liberating to kind of see like, well, no one's going to call me on it if I do this. Or <laughs> like, I, I, I've always wanted to like have read a book about something like this, and I, yeah, it's been very, very lucky for me to have that opportunity, and I've, I've loved hearing from people being like, "Wow, I didn't know that you wrote before," and it's like because I didn't show anyone <laughs> until now. But well, yeah. keep, keep at it and keep me posted. I'd love to hear how that, how that continues, and I hope you stay with it. I will. Thank you so much. You've you've honestly definitely been a been a very big part of that in terms of fiction and kind of seeing faces like mine in literature and in author writing. So I definitely thank you for that. Um, I will go back to the Q and A right now because I've seen that there's a bunch more questions that were just. Let me just. Okay, so we have a question from Jeff asking, my friend's daughter is mixed race and in early grade school. She's told her dad that she feels different from the other kids because of a number of things, including her hair. Mom and dad do their best to boost her confidence, but they are a bit down because she's feeling this way so young. What would you say to her to drive her confidence and help her to grow as a strong girl slash woman? Well, First of all, that's not at all uncommon. I mean, those are feelings that I had. They sound like the feelings that you might have had from time to time, Aaron. They're feelings that are very common. And they're especially common when you have black children or children, you know, of mixed race who, who are living in predominantly white environments without very many other black people around them. I think that's that can be one of the most challenging situations when you are really in a tiny minority and not really understood by or appreciated as well as you should be, you know, by the people in your immediate environment. And so one of the tasks, you know, if possible, you know, is to expose your child to as wide a variety of people as you can and to introduce them to and have them be with black people and experience the black arts and black literature or black films or black culture. Make, make that part of their lived experience so that even if they're not getting it in school, or on their street, you know, where they live, that they have opportunities to engage with and be part of black culture. And there are so many black cultural groups all over Southern Ontario that it wouldn't be that hard to get involved with one if you wanted. I mean, you yourself, Aaron, mentioned that you're part of the Afro-Canadian and Caribbean Association, and that'll be one of many groups that are, you know, in this very area. And so, um, and so that would be part of the step is to is to sort of introduce your children to other people who are like them and who and who can reinforce the fact that it's it's great and beautiful and normal to look like the way they do and and to grow into a sense of confidence. You know, maybe the child can go to a black hairdresser as well. You know, and feel good about that. There are lots of ways to reinforce a child's sense of well-being, and and part of it is exposing them in loving ways to other black people around them. Yes, I love I love that answer. Honestly, I, I totally agree 100% with what you've said. It's it's so important to, you know, get kids as involved as you can in the community and as someone who kind of does that work personally, I definitely agree. It's it's all about connections and 
so many different foster families you can kind of gain and in, in experience in that way, regardless of what families you have, and it's definitely important. The other question we have here are, what are you reading right now, or what is a book that you recommend? Oh, well, gosh, um, there are so many books. I just started reading the 1619 Project, which is a major and very significant book that came out of a series of long essays in the New York Times, uh, you know, writing about um, racism and structural racism and systemic racism, the history of the United States through a lens of uh, appreciating, you know, how race has played out in that country. So it's a it's a compendium of writings by by many different people. I'm also reading some books about the history of the N word and about how it's the N word has evolved over the centuries and what its meaning is. Because I'm noticing that in various school boards in southern Ontario, literature that contains the N word is starting to get banned or not being allowed to be taught. That would include some of my books, but also books by many other black writers. So the perhaps the unintended after effect, the unintended result of this decision to suspend the teaching of books that contain the N word is that black writers are being shut out of the curriculum because we sometimes we need to go there. Sometimes we need to explore the word and its hurtfulness because we're artists and we're trying to be real and we're trying to depict characters in the way that we've lived in the way we've experienced that word and we're trying to be real on the page so sometimes being real means going there in dialogue you know between characters even though it's not a word i say on the street i don't use it in a disrespectful way in conversation but sometimes as an artist i need to go there and so the 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 after effect of uh, of this uh, the result really of this decision is that now it will be increasingly difficult for black writers to be taught you know in school boards if they are indeed banning literature any literature that contains the n word so to answer the question i've been reading all sorts of articles and books and fascinating essays about the history of the n word just to get my head around uh, the evolution of this language and what it means and how i can how i can talk to teachers in the school system about how they could approach literature that does contain the n-word and not ban the literature but have healthy meaningful productive intelligent conversations about it and its harm in the classroom in a, in a safe way we had a question from jeff asking um could we get a list of some of the books in the history of the n-word was it mainly articles you were reading or were there any books that kind of popped up in your research yeah, uh, Randall Kennedy is one. He's a Harvard Law professor. John McWhorter is another. Uh, those are those are uh, two authors that I'm reading. Dick Gregory uh, has written about it as well. And there are many, many articles online, you know, by uh, scholars and other experts and thinkers in black culture about the, about the history of the N word. But I'd go to Randall Kennedy and John McWhorter would be two uh, two examples of people who've written uh, recently about the history of this word and, and its evolution and it's kind of and how it resonates in different ways inside black culture. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And I invite anyone if they have any last minute questions to ask as we have a few minutes left in our programming. And a question I actually wanted to ask very quickly was, so you 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 promised that you would make this book for your daughter, uh, I think you said 15 years ago. How does she feel knowing that you actually full on made a book? <laughs> and like, like I, I feel like if I said that to a seven year old, like, yeah, I'll, I'll write a book dedicated to you, and then I actually did it. Like, is how does she feel knowing that there's a book dedicated to her out there? She's thrilled. She's very proud. She's really delighted. Um, she's not the you know I dedicated other books to my earlier children. Beatrice is featured in this way in a much bigger way even though the character, of course, is a fictional Beatrice, let's remember that. But uh, uh, Genevieve, my eldest daughter, her middle name is Aminata, and I gave her middle name to my character, my protagonist in the Book of Negroes. So the, the protagonist in the Book of Negroes is a woman, a girl and a woman who whose name is Aminata, you know, named after my eldest daughter. And I dedicated, you know, a book to my son, Andrew, and a and another to my daughter Carolyn, and so Beatrice was last in line, so she felt it was her turn. But <laughs> she's, she's she's very happy about it. That's great. I love to hear that. Okay, I think that is all of the questions we have. 
So I think we will we can wrap up our conversation. And so I just want to say thank you so much for talking with me today, Lawrence. I know that I've, like I said before, I've been a huge, huge, huge fan of your books for so long. And we've, we've talked about um, so many issues today. I think that's something that I, I've picked up on a lot of your, your readings is kind of talking about mixed race issues. And honestly, your book, Blackberry Sweet Juice, is has been like a Bible to me for the past oh. like years of my life. And I tell, I've told all of my siblings, everyone I know, for mixed race, that it's it's such an amazing book because it, it it's one of if not the just peak book that kind of just addresses all of those issues in a beautiful way and is so infused with self love and truth and honesty that I applaud you for that. So I, I I'm glad I get to finally say thank you so much for that and thank you for Beatrice and Croc Harry because it's it's equally as amazing a book and I think it'll even have the ability to reach so many children and I I love that and I'm sure that. You're very excited for that. So I thank you so much for today and for your book and all of your work. Thank you so much, Aaron. I really enjoyed the conversation. Let's stay in touch. I want to hear about your writing and the great things you're doing in the community. And thank you also to the Hamilton Public Library for making me feel so welcome in this town and in the library. And I hope and I know that we'll be encountering each other again. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Have a good night, everyone. Take care. Good night.